Hi everyone, welcome to Elwood City Limits. We're doing, uh, well, it's, uh, we're not quite back just, just yet. But, uh, well, I, it seemed like a good time. The mailbag is fit to burst, and it's time to, uh, get back to some of you lovely listeners. But mm. sometimes the problem is that we do this a little bit asynchronously. I, of course, am Will Young, and for a lot of the mailbags, that's kind of something that I do by myself. But we have so many mail responses, and, uh, we want to hit the ground running with our first ECL coming back next week. So I figured... Why don't I invite Lucas along for this mailbag? Hey, Lucas. Hey, here's the mail. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. Mail. Absolutely. So, yeah, like I said, our mailbag, our correspondences, since we have uh, implemented the summer schedule, have been quite, um, there's been a lot of them. So we wanted to acknowledge them and give them their own time, because as you may well know, when we come back for ECL at the start of September, there's going to be a lot of Arthur-related things to talk about. So I kind of wanted to get right down to those, but I also didn't want to leave y'all out so we decided to do another mailbag episode, this time with Lucas, uh, for just that reason. I, I mean, I never I never intend to leave you out, Lucas, but mailbag episodes are often kind of a spur-of-the-moment thing. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we were able to get together today. I, I honestly have a little bit of FOMO every time you do the solo mailbag. I listen and I go, oh, I would have had an answer to that. There are questions, so glad to lend my services uh, to talk to the people. Who this is all really about, you know, at the end of the day, there would be no ECL without dear listeners. Very true. Uh, also want to uh, give a shout out, of course. It's been a little while, and we have actually had quite the influx of new patrons at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. So I think it's a good time to say thank you to some of the people who have followed us recently, including Iman Salehian. Sorry, Iman, I hope that I pronounced your last name right. Joe Low Flow, Alex K, Charlie Heckman, J Wags, Ron Gonzalez, Ant Eater 21, who we may hear from in this very episode, and our latest, Alexandria Dukes. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the Discord. Welcome to the Patreon, and hope you enjoy your content. We have a new Patreon episode of For the Kids coming out this week, and we'll have a preview of it on the free feed very, very soon. Coming this way, your, your way this weekend, actually. But what we're talking about here is the correspondencies that we have gotten over at ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. Now, there's a couple of shorter ones. I would call those email shoutouts that I want to uh, make sure to acknowledge and then we have some longer form emails so first of all the shorter ones i want to say hello to tanya who wrote an email about being able to relate to memorizing arthur episodes and sound effects much like i have spoken up before so tanya thank you uh caitlin who one of the listeners who found us from our recent appearance on the finding dw podcast if you haven't listened to that i certainly encourage you to listen to not just our episode but the entire show as well now, Lucas, Caitlin actually lived in the Bedford, Halifax area and studied public relations at Mount St. Vincent University, which is right down the street from where I live. That's that's wild. I uh, know people who took that program. I wonder uh, if they would know Caitlin or if this was long ago or, or what have you, because it's very similar to a, a program I took at the NSCC. Um, small world. And Caitlin is currently living in Pictou County, which is also a part of our lovely province of Nova Scotia. So thank you, Caitlin. Always good to have a local listener uh, find us. Another uh, person who found us from Finding DW uh, is named Marla. And Marla uh, related that she watched Arthur with her son back in the day. So Marla, thank you very much for listening. And finally, Trisha wanted to become a patron. But at the time, we had 69 patrons. And Trisha didn't want to break the magic number such as it is. Well, we've actually passed 69, and we're into the 70s now. So, Trisha, come on back anytime you want. And Trisha appreciates that we keep it clean, which is a little bit strange considering the, you know, 69 mention. Yes. Kids don't look that up. Uh, number uh, one family-friendly podcast in Halifax. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> uh, all right, so now we're going to get into some of the longer-form emails. Uh, so we go to the mailbag. Our first one here is from Malik. For the past three weeks, been an avid listener of the podcast, I'm about to turn 20. I'm still an avid fan. While I was watching Disney's Doug on Disney Plus, I noticed during the credits the writers happened to be former Arthur alumni, alumni, excuse me, Joe Fallon and Ken Scarborough, who worked on the early seasons of Arthur. This could explain the reference slash lawyer friendly cameo that popped up in the season five episode 
Doug's last birthday. In a lot of ways, Doug's feels Doug feels like a possible glimpse of what life for Arthur and his pals might be if they were actually allowed to move up a grade instead of being perpetual third graders. Like in one episode, Doug has to deal with the results of Skeeter suddenly dating rich girl BB. Could you imagine an older Arthur actually dealing with that if Buster and Muffy somehow became a couple? Well, there's those are those are uh, pretty pertinent. Um, uh, comparisons between characters Doug, Skeeter, and BB map pretty well onto Arthur, Buster, and Muffy. Were you much for Doug back in the day? No, Lucas? Doug is definitely one of those shows where, um, I, and we've had this conversation before about uh, the differences between people your age and people my age, you know, the difference between yeah. an elder millennial and a young millennial. Um, and there's these certain cultural touch points like uh, Gargoyles, Taking Back Sunday. Um, and I, I would put Doug in that category as well. Doug is a show I'm definitely familiar with because of pop culture, but when I was a kid, it was never on. So I think it's a little bit before my time, but I know it's, it's really important, uh, to people your age. Yes, it's yeah, certainly quite popular and very, very cut from this very similar cloth as Arthur, although for a slightly older and perhaps even edgier audience since it was a Nickelodeon show before it was Disney. Uh, Malik continues here. What characters from Arthur could be matched to possible counterparts on Doug? Arthur would obviously be Doug. Pal would be Porkchop. BB would be Muffy. Buster would definitely be Skeeter. But I'll leave the rest to you. Maybe you could do a Doug podcast if that doesn't already exist. Well, I, I think the Arthur podcast keeps us quite busy. So I'll leave the Doug podcast to uh, to others. Um, in fact, I believe What a Cartoon did an episode on Doug that was quite thorough and very enjoyable as it usually is. Um, yeah, the only ones I could think of would be like uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna blank on their names. Um, well, Patty doesn't Patty mayonnaise doesn't really map onto anybody that I can think of. And oh my god, the 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 purple guy, the name is killing me, Mister Something. Duh, he seem he strikes me as a Principal Haney type. That's kind of. My Doug knowledge only doesn't only goes so far. Like I watched it a bit, but it didn't really didn't really stick. Second of all, recently listened to your commentary on Arthur, it's only rock and roll, and can't help but notice that you guys left out a very notable detail. This is the episode in which DW completely and utterly declares that she is through with crazy bus. DW says uh, that she wants to try out for a band to be rich and famous. Arthur says the only song you know is Crazy Bus. DW says Crazy Bus is for babies. I know a million better songs. Malik says clearly this was a reference to Joe Fallon's departure from the series after the fourth season. Apparently the special's writer, Kathy Wog, or someone on the staff, decided to end DW's obsession with the song so they didn't have to pay Joe to use it anymore. I'm not sure if that's exactly how that works but it is an interesting reference and yeah. uh yeah we didn't catch it as the nature of the commentary I, goes i assume now i'm no lawyer but i assume all music produced specifically for arthur is owned wholesale by yeah uh, the yeah. studios uh but i don't know who knows the, the yep, music yeah. royalties are different than tv royalties so uh it's still an, an, an interesting theory and and definitely um great attention to detail a great piece of arthur trivia Another great reason to watch uh, that great special. Wish you all the best in continuing this podcast. Thank you, Malik. A uh, quick one here from Funeth. Do you guys fo- do you guys find more rewatchability from a bad old movie than a really good new movie? Oh. So, Lucas, bad old or good new? <laughs> this is I don't know if this is this is definitely going to be one of those questions that might be contentious between us. But this is a topic I'm very passionate about. Uh, I am a firm believer in the rewatchability of bad old versus yeah, good new. Um, yeah. I've this is something I, I feel more and more strongly as days go by. Uh, but you can look a movie, look at a movie like I'll give an example. Like if you go back and look at like Mortal Kombat, like the nineteen, I think nineteen ninety eight, nineteen ninety seven movie. Uh, yeah, Paul Thomas Anderson, not a good movie by any or, or PT Anderson. It's I get the Andersons all mixed up, but anyway, it's the guy who makes those Resident Paul Evil w. movies. Paul W S Anderson. Paul W S Anderson, not not to besmirch the good name of Paul Thomas Anderson, but um, yeah. uh, that's one of those movies where by all counts is a bad film. Um, but there is a spark and there is an originality to the way that movie is shot and there's a the physicality to that movie that is totally not present uh, in today's quote-unquote bad filmmaking. So like when you see a bad movie today, 
Um, it just kind of is, is muddled and like just kind of washes over you. you it, it, it feels like you're looking at your phone halfway and then looking at the movie. Whereas when you watch a bad movie from yesteryear uh, where uh, people were limited by what they could put in front of a camera, um, yeah. there's always some sort of ingenuity to kind of be gleaned from it, right? So um, when I'm watching a bad movie that's whether it's poorly acted or, or poorly written, um, the fact that people had to actually make the things that they're putting in front of the camera, they couldn't just uh, make it with a computer, uh, yeah. makes all of those movies have a little bit something that's interesting to me as someone who's interested in filmmaking um, bec- or the process of filmmaking, right? Like that's the kind of lens I always view movies in for better or for worse. Um, thinking, you know, how did they get this shot? Where what, what is this trying to convey, you know? And I find watching old bad movies, it's just like a wealth of delights because you can kind of see the seams of the filmmaking even a little bit more um, by the nature of it's kind of bad and everything kind of looks fake. But it, it, it looks fake, but there's real things in front of the camera, right? So uh, I was watching Demons 2, which isn't a bad movie, by the way. It's a great movie. Um, but there's a part in Demons 2 where this girl's getting attacked by, like, a demon baby. And the demon baby is quite obviously, like, a rubber puppet. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was absolutely delighted and having the time of my life. Whereas if Demons 2 was made direct-to-DVD in, like, 2011... Um, it would, you know, that rubber puppet would be CGI and it'd be totally forgettable. Um, now that's not a perfect comparison to what we're talking about. Cause that's kind of talking about a bad new movie versus a bad old movie, but uh, I'm, I'm biased. I'm, I'm going with old on this. What, what about you, Will? I largely agree with what you say. I think, yeah. I think you acquitted that argument quite well. The only thing I'll add is that a lot of times when you find a newer a newer movie, let's say one that was made within the past 10 years, it is really good. For At least for me as a viewer, it tends to enter that sort of stage of like, okay, I don't want to watch this all the time because then I'm going to get tired of mm. it. And, I, and like if it's a good movie, I don't want to get tired of it. Yeah. So a lot of times I'll see a good movie. These days I'm getting back into owning physical media and I'll like buy the blue ray or the dvd and then i'll just kind of like maybe once a year maybe like once or like once or twice a year i'll return to it and i'll have a good time and i'll just kind of encase it in amber a little bit i don't i never want it to lose its charm yeah so uh yeah there is there is something to that but i think you uh you explained it quite well over over the course of the quarantine uh i've been getting into the habit of watching more movies uh, like i used to when i was younger uh and something that i find is that um the mark of a great movie, whether it's it's known as good, quote unquote, or bad, quote unquote, the thing that will make any movie worthwhile is if there is a moment from it that will stick in your brain, right? So I think the ultimate sin of a movie um, is that when you've forgotten it the second you've finished it, whereas the movies mm-hmm. that I find really stick with me, whether they are good or bad, that is the mark of like great filmmaking, right? So uh, I just find that older movies have a tendency to really burrow their way in my brain and and I I will think back to them more and more and more. Um, Like, I I think I brought this up on the podcast, but there's this uh, old Japanese movie called Quaden um, that's like a a Japanese anthology horror movie. It's like uh, uh, five different ghost stories in one movie. It's from the 60s. Um, And that's a movie I keep thinking about over and over and over again, and it's really kind of burrowed its way into my subconscious. Whereas, like, when I saw Space Jam 2, uh, at the time, I was with a big group of friends, and we were yucking it up. But the, the second that movie ended, it was like, it got, I got the uh, Men in Black, like, mind wipe happened to me. And I can't recall a single thing that happened in it besides the uh, uh, properties that showed up. Like, oh, Rick and Morty. Spoilers! Rick and Morty show up at some point. And that's like, all, <coughs> excuse me, that's all I can remember. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of times and the, with modern movies, it feels almost more like a roller coaster. It's a mm. sensory experience while you're there. But, you know, remembering it is not as fun as being there mm. in front of it. So we move now to Brian from Natick, who is new to the podcast. I'm 41. Arthur began when I was in high school. Started watching a few years ago with my now six-year-old. I was probably aware of Arthur, but I'd never seen any of it. You mentioned a book about the series coming out in a random episode I listened to. Anything happened with that? Is it available anywhere? I actually responded personally to Brian here, but I just wanted to remind everybody that, yes, there is an Arthur book that is coming out in January that is kind of meant to be an encapsulation of... um, of the 
at least the run of the show, if not kind of the run of Arthur so far. It's called Believe in Yourself, What We Learned from Arthur, and it is by Mark Brown. Uh, and you can pre-order it on Amazon right now. And, uh, yeah, once it comes out, I'm going to pre-order it pretty soon. And then once it comes out and we get the time to kind of read it and look at it, uh, we'll have a bit more to say on that. Yeah, but that's we, coming uh, January next year. We should think about, like, an ECL book club with the patrons or something like that. That could be Ooh. interesting. Yeah, I like that idea. Next one's from Lauren, who just found the podcast a few weeks ago. While I watched Arthur here and there as a kid, I really got into it in my 20s. Being blind, I appreciated the Marina-centered episodes for their accurate portrayal of what living with a visual impairment is like. I recently listened to your review of Operation DW. While I found your thoughts informative and enjoyable, I also found myself becoming angry every time one of you talked about trusting doctors as a child. From the time I was four until I was 16, I endured multiple eye surgeries. Rarely did I receive the kind care portrayed in Operation DW. In fact, there was only one time I felt seen behind those double doors of a room I feared returning to for the first 16 years of my life. Most of the time I was spoken to harshly by nurses, told to be quiet and held down while a mask was shoved over my face, my cries of fear going uncomforted. Did did I mention I couldn't see what was going on? Not once was I offered a comforting hand to hold or offered words of reassurance, nor were my questions answered. Obviously, as I grew older, I realized I wasn't being punished, but I tried ex- but try explaining that to me at age four to twelve. Uh, No child should have to get used to what I endured for 16 years. Watching Operation DW for the first time after it aired, I was triggered, even though back then I didn't know what that word meant. Then the anger came. Before I finish up, please know that I'm not yelling at you guys. My first angry thought about the episode was, how dare Arthur lie to kids? Why wasn't the show telling them the truth? Why wasn't it showing them that not all doctors were kind and anesthesia inductions could be traumatic without support? Logically, I understand that there were good doctors out there. I just rarely experienced having them. After this initial thought hit me, a question circled around my brain. Hadn't I deserved that level of compassion from doctors and OR nurses as a kid? I just wanted to give you guys a different perspective on going through surgery as a kid. Uh, also, what did the bear DW was given by the nurse look like? And to answer your question, DW had a CBC taken, not her blood pressure, a complete blood count. Thank you for taking the time to read my message and letting me share my experience with you guys. The next one will be more positive, I promise. Well, this is the kind of thing that we always say, and we do welcome. If you ever have kind of either constructive criticism or of uh you know an arthur episode that we've talked about or the the manner in which we've talked about it we always welcome it but i completely understand uh well i can't completely understand (laughs) but i can see i can see where you're coming from lauren and that sounds you know that sounds like a lot that you had to go through as a kid and i'm very sorry to hear that and i can see how for children like this like this is what i was interested in i was like does this message track with kids who are maybe a bit more um ill or require more medical care um because i think it's from what i remember about operation dw it is written from a rather privileged perspective of like oh i just have to go to the hospital for like this one operation not not necessarily a child who requires multiple operations over a significant length of time which can definitely um change your opinion of the hospital system i'm sure yeah uh, and so I, I appreciate and, that we got that and i you know uh first first and foremost i want to thank you so much for giving us you know such a uh a nuanced and uh vulnerable uh perspective that's totally invaluable uh uh and it's it's really great when listeners share kind of those sides of the story that me and you are kind of incapable of touching on because we can't haven't experienced them um with that being said i do think that in the episode i remember you talking about you know your wife has had some uh experiences that are kind of suboptimal with the healthcare system and it, it's not yeah. all sunshine and roses over here uh mm-hmm. uh so you know it's one of those things where it's tricky right because it's like uh mileage may vary i i think that uh um the uh it's true uh not every experience in the healthcare system is a positive one in fact some people might say uh based on their circumstance more often than not they could be more negative than positive um though i'm not quite sure that that's even what the the arthur episode is trying to convey i think um in, in the messages in dw's particular case uh she doesn't need to be so anxious 
But I, I suppose if you know you had lived that experience um, and it was it was kind of the opposite, maybe you know DW did have something to worry about. So I guess it's all to say that I really value the listener's email. Um, yeah. And uh, for better or for worse, uh, Operation DW has definitely been an episode that's sparked a lot of discussion around here at the old ECL, uh, which is usually the mark of a, a at least an interesting episode. Uh, not to say that rather if it's good or bad, but just that it, it, there's definitely been uh, a lot of emails and conversation and our conversation with uh, Jason Swimmer as well, uh, kind of surrounding that episode. By the way, our conversation with Jason Swimmer is now available on the free feed if you haven't checked it out yet. And Lauren, to answer your question, the teddy bear that DW got, it's a very, uh, what I would call a standard a standard bear. It's a little brown bear with kind of rounded ears, a kind smile. He's uh, sit, he kind of seated up in a seated position. Almost looks a little bit like a, well, sorry. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a similar design to like a teddy gram. Um, you know, like the Teddy Graham cookie, but it's a very, it's a very basic brown bear. He doesn't have any hands. His his uh, his arms kind of round off with like a little circle, but he's got a smile on his face, just kind of your standard smiley brown bear. Our next one is from Awesome Eddie Twenty One, one of our patrons. Hey, Will and Lucas, I wanted to give my take on the end of Arthur. So just to be clear. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna super get into the end of Arthur unquote, but I did want to read this email from <laughs> awesome from Awesome Eddie Twenty One. Most people are sad that it's ending because they grew up watching Arthur. I definitely understand the sadness people feel, but in my opinion, nobody should be sad about Arthur ending. Arthur is about his family and his friends and what they go through in life. I don't think it can go on forever. The seasons and episodes that we grew up with will always be here to go back and revisit. The early seasons are a plus content for kids and adults as long as we keep watching and talking about the show. Arthur will truly never end. Um, what do you guys think of the drawing Mark Brown posted on Insta- Instagram? I think we'll save that for next week. I will make sure I'll make a little note to talk about that because there has been some confusion around that, and I can understand the confusion, but it also kind of frustrates me. As um, the only thing I'll add um, is that I think it's okay for people to be sad that Arthur is ending. Um, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's necessarily what this email is saying, but it's also just like, it's, I, it's not exactly, I'm not sad myself either, but we will get into that. Uh, We will get into that later. Um, and it next week to be precise. I, I think my one little comment I'll make about this. And again, we will get into this in more detail next week. Is that yes. uh, um, I've we've seen a lot more shows be better served by ending early as opposed by going on too long. I'd much rather Arthur end early than go the way of, for instance, The Simpsons or something. So we'll we'll, sure. we'll we'll expand on that a little bit more uh, in the coming weeks. This one comes from our new one of our new patrons, Claire. Uh, who is reading an article about Arthur Ending, talked about Finding DW, listened to the Finding DW podcast, led to Elwood City Limits. There you go. The uh, the Arthur Ending to Elwood City Limits pipeline is alive and well. I'm writing to comment about DW. I wanted to let you know that I agree with Will that DW gets away with far too much on the show, and Lucas is just a DW apologist. <laughs> I know you covered these two episodes a long time ago, but I think DW is pretty insufferable in Arthur's big hit and more. I totally agree that Will with Will that DW was out of line in Arthur's big hit, and I really wish the show had shown the parents disciplining her in any way. DW completely ignored the totally understandable boundaries that Arthur placed. Further, as watching the after watching the more episode, I don't know how DW has any friends. Honestly, after watching the show as an adult, I feel bad for Emily. She just sort of resigns herself to DW's outbursts. Anyway, I love the show and respect both of your opinions, but I wanted y'all to know that I'm on hashtag Team Will wow. when it comes to opinions on DW. I still think DW is an amusing character to watch, and she's a great meme generator. Sometimes, though, I think the show takes her just a little too far. P.S. As an adult, George is by far my favorite character. Sweet little angel boy. So, Lucas, I want to I want to address a, uh, two things here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. First of, I mean, God, this we recorded. We must have recorded that episode like four four years ago at this point. I believe so. so. It's tough. It's tough to say exactly what my opinion was, but I want to address the fact that Lucas is the DW apologist around here. The I the ECL, I I feel has always been a DW safe space. You know, it's true. It's I, true. I I think we both have very strong positive feelings about her, and usually walk away. Uh, feeling feeling that way, the both of us. Mm-hmm. And now, with this particular episode, I can imagine that I was. I I think if I remember correctly, 
Um, I, I, I think Claire's probably right. She probably listened to it <laughs> more recently than I did. I, I was probably the person bringing up the like, well, where, you know, it's, it's a little bit limp. DW's kind of, uh, share of whatever punishment is may or may not be deserved is a little limp, but that isn't to throw out DW as a character entirely. I, mm-hmm. I'm sorry that she doesn't quite hit for you in that way, Claire, but you know, it's, I, I love I love DW. I, I want to I just want to say that Lucas is not an island here. Listen, Claire. First off, thank you for your listenership. Welcome to the family, the ECL, the ECL Village. I'm so glad to have you. Uh, second, um, you uh, support uh, child assault. If you that's your take from that episode, <laughs> oh, that DW deserved to get punched in the face. Uh, oh, brother. That's that's listen. They're four. <laughs> a four-year-old, it's a model plane. You know? What do you think it's for? You don't understand when you're four that you, this, do you know what this is? This is like those people that get mad. They make memes about like, oh, uh, when when my nephew comes over and they take my expensive Figmas out of the trophy case or they, the, they, the they, 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 Figma? they break, it's an expensive Japanese figurine or they break my, <laughs> They they okay. br- they break my you know Lego Star Destroyer you know they don't appreciate it. it's it, they're children, let them break the dang toys. Uh, okay, so uh, Lucas, I want to piggyback off what you're saying there because I pretty much also like mostly agree, and I, I and 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 I don't want to especially because Lauren's a patron, but no matter even if even excuse me. Especially because Claire's a patron, but even if you weren't Claire, I don't want this to sound like we're ganging up on you or disagreeing with you or contradicting ourselves. Um, oh, listen, I've been apparently I've been ideologically consistent for four years. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there's any hypocrite between the two of us, it's probably me, and that's just because of my really bad memory. But that's the other thing, and I would have thought that I would brought this up four years ago, and if I didn't, I apologize. Uh, clearly my mind has changed in the sense that DW is a child and this is, I don't just see this in discussions about Arthur either. I see it with discussions with television shows that have child characters and it's just like, well, why are they acting like this? I'm like, dude, kids, like it feels, it feels like cheap or something. It's like, it's, it's, you know what? The first thing I think of is like, if you've ever seen the movie, the Babadook and it's like the kid acts like a, like a terror. And you watch the movie, and of course, in the back of your head, you're thinking, like, why can't this kid just not be like this? And it's like, well, first of all, that's the source of tension for that entire movie. And second of all, sorry, kids are kids are not angels. And DW is not certainly not painted as any angel at any point. Now, I will give you that, you know, this the way that DW is portrayed, I can understand, can rub people the wrong way. And I completely understand that but i think it's also a thing as like as you get older and especially claire i don't know if you have any younger siblings or younger family members or anything like that but like be having the chance to be around more kids and young people you especially see this kind of behavior like manifest in different ways but like annoying behavior like juvenile behavior like all the time and it really is just a case of like None of us were as mature or as angelic as we think we were when we were kids. And the same, and the same goes for DW. I completely, I respect your feelings about how DW can be insufferable. I can absolutely see that. But for me, it is just like, it's what Lucas said. It's like, she's a kid. I, you know, there's, there's so much like the, especially around Arthur's big hit, the conversation goes on and on about who deserved what, but (laughs) I it's so hard for me to not look at DW and just see like oh a, a little precocious child and 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 essentially you know pretty as as powerful as a little precocious child is which is to say not at all the power they get is the power you give them you know what I'm you know what I mean it's like the more that you react to them or like blow up at their behavior the more it kind of emboldens them because they see like they they see the, they see the consequences they see what it does they get the reaction they're looking for anyway i know that's a little bit bit scattered but i wanted to just kind of make it clear how i feel about it in 2021 as opposed to I don't know, 2017 mm. when we probably recorded that episode. We'll check back in four years when you've flip flopped again and you'll say, hey, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been practicing on the speed bag for next time I run into DW myself. <laughs> 
Claire, thank you very much for the email. <laughs> Again, we we do appreciate we do appreciate you. We take no offense, and we uh, we're glad that you emailed in. And please continue to do so with uh, wh- whatever you feel. Next one is from Shamim, uh, who passed along a little note that he wrote to Mark Brown. It was a very it was a very good story. Um, I would recommend looking up Shamim Dana on Instagram, and you can follow him there. Um, he, when he was 28, he sent a letter to Mark Brown and it went a little something like this. I'm a huge fan of yours since 1997. I have a special story for you. When I was four years old, May 19th, 1997, my favorite Arthur episode was Arthur's lost library book. And I love that episode so much that my late grandmother who passed away in 2008, when she was living, she created a special one of a kind copy of your characters and a book version of my favorite episode of yours. Arthur's Lost Library book. She had wrote it and hand illustrated it herself and gave it to me December 1997. 24 years later and I still have the book. My dream and goal is to have you autograph my special copy and my copy of this slip case and wouldn't you know it, Mark Brown did just that. So this is a little bit of positivity for the timeline. Miss mm. Mark Brown is as good as gold and uh, definitely made the made the day of Shamim when he uh, when he signed that. Living legend Mark Brown. And you know what? We're going to return that. We're going to respond in kind by buying his book, apparently, uh, Yo, you better for all his it. good behavior. Absolutely. Our final email comes from Omid, who is in fourth grade. All right, Lucas, Lucas, hey, 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 straighten up, straighten up. We got to, there's there's kids mm, listening mm, here. We got to put that, put that cigarette out. <laughs> okay, yes. No more jokes about assaulting children. <laughs> I love the podcast, always gets a chuckle out of me, and unlike most kids, I understand and like grown-up stuff. By the way, do you guys like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter more? I like Lord of the Rings more. Uh, Lord of the Rings for me, Lucas, what about you? Uh, if I had to pick between the two, I like Lord of the Rings more. And we've def- we've gotten this question before, but for you, Omid, we will happily answer. Who's your favorite character and why? For me, it is Arthur, and my reason is because he's just an average kid like me. Uh, at this oh. point in the podcast, Omid, uh, it, it would have to be Fern. I love how uh, interesting her episodes are. I think she's really cool as a detective, and I think she's very witty as well. Uh, and I'm going to stick with my day one. It's definitely Binky, uh, I would say. The best character in the whole show, the character with the most death, depth, as well as the character that makes me laugh the most. Um, I'm a big Binky fan. One might say I think Binky rules. Binky does rule. I have to agree with you there. All right. That's the end of our emails and messages. Thanks so much to everybody for corresponding with uh, with us. We appreciate all of your feedback. And I do mean all of your feedback. Now, of course, coming up uh, later on this weekend, you will get a preview of our latest episode of For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast, which is all about Marvin, the tap dancing horse, as we uh, are getting close to the end of our Bookworm Bunch series. We are also going to be back on Friday with a new Elwood City Limits where we will be talking about our five-year anniversary and we will also be talking about, yes, the alleged end of Arthur. But Lucas, uh, I wanted to give you this time because there are two other very important things that are happening right now for Elwood City Limits and we should definitely talk about them and that being both the Coast's Best of Halifax Award and our fifth anniversary stream. Could you please inform, could you please give us the pitch? So the Coast Best of Halifax Halifax Award. We've talked about this on the show before. Uh, Every year that the Coast has been doing it, it is the weekly, uh, the alt weekly in our city. And one of the categories is best podcast. And we are a Halifax podcast. And we've talked about where we're from. We talk about where we're from almost every single episode. Um, And so it would really mean the world to me and Will uh, if we could, two steps. One, get nominated. And that's what's going on right now. So if you go to, uh, I I don't have the URL in front of me, Will. But it's like, if you just look up uh, Best of Halifax, The Coast, um, you're going to be able to get to the quiz and and go to the Best Podcast section and nominate Elwood City Limits. That's step one. And Are you you ready? I will give you the the URL right now. Oh, hit me with the business. Vote.thecoast.ca. So easy. So go to the vote.thecoast.ca. 
Um, if you go down to Best Podcast, I think Elwood City Limits is already like an autofill from the drop down menu, and that's thanks to you, dear yeah, listeners. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's step one. That gets us nominated. Step two, and we'll let you know when this happens. Once all the nominees are finalized, uh, hopefully, if we get nominated, uh, we'll need you to go and vote for us uh, because me and Will get a nice plaque and also get to go to a fancy party if we win. And it would just be really nice because uh, I think we have a pretty good podcast. Uh, like I said, I number, number one family-friendly podcast. The other thing, and this one, it's not work for you guys. It's more fun. Um, it is our Twitch stream. And I know it's a little bit after the official anniversary, the official five years. But me and Will wanted to do something special for our um, half of a decade of Elwood City Limits. So on September 4th, on the weekend at 8 p.m. AST, that's Atlantic Standard Time, um, we are going to be going live on Twitch. Um, I believe the URL is twitch.tv slash Elwood City Limits pod. Is that correct, Will? Um, uh, keep doing the spiel. Yeah, I will just make sure uh, it is twitch.tv yes. slash Elwood City Limits Pod. And so we are going to be going live. It's going to be me and Will. Uh, we're going to be having a lot of fun stuff, including interacting with you listeners in the chat, as well as uh, reacting to Arthur and Arthur adjacent content. So make sure uh, if you want to send us an email at the podcast email or, or a, a Twitch DM or wherever you get a hold of us, uh, let us know what kind of videos you want us to react to um, on the Twitch stream. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm excited excited to see all of you in the chat and, and celebrate five years it's hard to believe of Elwood City Limits this is going to be a lot of fun and we're really looking forward to seeing you there and thank you to everybody who has nominated us so far and uh, if you would consider nominating us we really appreciate it and we're going to be seeing you very soon next week for Elwood City Limits and if you're a patron well you're probably hearing from us already for the kids of PBS Kids Podcast and uh, to all of our new patrons welcome and please enjoy the feast of content that awaits you patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits thank you everybody for joining us for this special mailbag we'll talk to you again very soon and it will be uh, one of the more important episodes I'd like to say as we're talking about the end of Arthur and of course another episode of this fine program all right i'm will young and for lucas mancini oh I, we don't have any, we don't have something to quote there's no we've i i i've never done a mailbag i don't know how to I, I, outro the show I, I, hmm should i just quote like uh, hmm like I, I, I'm trying to think of a pop culture quote off the top of my head, but it's none of them are family friendly. Like I was like, oh, I can no, do that. I can do that quote from Heat. Good. I could do, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, bye everybody. <laughs> bye everybody. <laughs>